this is assuming that uh, there are other processes that have happened before. For instance, the site has already been visited. Like engineer said, most of the times you'll have trial pits that are done. These are generally, just as it suggests, holes dug at strategic places that the engineer recommends so that they can check level of foundation, qual the quality of the soil, the soil, the tests that they, that they do. Further to that is checking of the beacons as well. So we will, ha we will have done our due diligence as far as, as, far as the site is concerned. Uh, sewage connections, electrical connections, uh, services, uh, so on and so forth. The site board, just to highlight, generally just shows the approval number it shows the consultants that you have on board at a glance. Like we said, NCA, the county council, they do inspect periodically. Now, once you get to site, there are various stages. On the BQ, so just to use some technical jargon, <laughs> we usually have superstructure and substructures. So just as the name suggests, substructure is anything that's below ground. Superstructure is everything that's above ground. So once you come in, the first step is to do what we call the setting out which is the extent of the building. As the architect, that is what we would go and inspect and check that indeed, this is the position of the column, check it from the boundary wall, check the walling, anything that goes below ground, that is what would, we would check at, at that point. Maybe engineer can expound, say now on, on foundation, what should be looking out for. After the trial pits are, are dug, the engineer's role is to come and check the nature of that uh, soil. For example, in the design of the foundations, as I said earlier, the building will eventually sit on that ground. And the grounds are very different. You could have maybe one side you have rock, then the, an outcrop, and on the other side you find maybe black cotton. Each of these types of earth or grounds have what is called the safe bearing capacity. For example, if I have red coffee soil, the safe bearing capacity could be in the range of 8 to 100 kilonewton per millimeter square. That figure is used in the design of the foundation, the footing. Uh, it will tell you how big will the footing be, or if it's a strip footing, will you need to reinforce it uh, because concrete on its own may not be able to take it. If I find it's rock, like if it's soft rock, and maybe I had designed, for example, assuming that it was uh, maram or black cotton. I may have to adjust, for example, because I said, for example, the red soil was 80, hard rock would be 450. With a 450, it means I can easily adjust my foundations. They can be uh, smaller. I can have less reinforcement. But if you don't go and inspect, you could find you either over designing your foundations or under designing. And that can be very dangerous. Therefore, it's very important when the trial pits are done. The structural engineer visits the site to ascertain that what is on the ground is what was assumed in the submitted drawings. The other important thing uh, of visiting the site is to know the depths. How deep are we going? Sometimes you may find you have a very deep overlay of very unacceptable soil. Like black cotton, as we all know, is not a good soil to lay a, a foundation on. Supposing the black cotton goes three, four, five meters deep, there are methods of adjusting the type of foundation. So without visiting the site, then one don't be able to make that important design for the substructure. Just from your foundation, you should get into a slab, but she had talked about different kinds of soil, so there's different kind of foundations. <laughs> I think that's a, a whole other topic. So yes, you, you do get into the level where you have your, your slab. And at this point, we also check the extents of the slab. Little details sometimes get missed out at this point. From an architectural point of view, we might want the slab set in at some point because there's something coming out in terms of cladding at the top. We want it to go all the way down. And those are the little things that we check at that point. If you also have, say, mechanical electrical engineers at the slab, there are elements that go in for, from the services, some pipes, some conduits, and the plumbers, the electricians put these in. And also during the vibration phase, you'll find that some of these consultants actually come on board during that period to check that the, the pipes are not damaged. So it's always better to have these consultants on board 
that can just assist to double check or even have a proper electrician, a proper certified plumber that can just ensure that their services are not tampered with. It's very important because remember this lab is sitting directly on the ground and the maram and hardcore. There is it's a, a, a media that cuts the direct um, uh, uprising of water by what in science is called by capillary action. So you cut off the rising water. So that detail is very important. Otherwise, you live in a house with a lot of issues uh, in future and you may not be able to go back. 40% of your cost of construction is the structure. The most costly items are your slabs, your roofs, and your foundation. Contrary to popular belief, the walling is a very small, in fact, I, I would dare say it's probably the cheapest component in, 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 in the building when it comes to the, to the structure. But generally, you'll also notice once you get out from the foundation, the other levels tend to go faster. I think foundation is usually the one that takes the longest time and it does cost quite a bit. So you can imagine from that 40%, if your walling is a small component of it, then how much more does actually go into your skeleton, like engineer said. If you have professionals, they'll always give you a, a costing and you can actually do cash flow projections. So you can know that say to put down my foundation, it's going to cost me this much. And then you'll always have a bit of a contingency and you can always phase it out that way. The, the professionals can advise you on how to phase out so that also your, your building does not end up getting worn out and you also end up using more money to just you know, patch it up and make it look presentable. After uh, the, the, the slab on the ground floor, then um, depending on whether it, you have columns or load bearing walls, uh, which need now to start coming up on the superstructure, then you continue with the, 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 the columns which come up, the reinforcements. That's where now you come in with your bar bending schedules. Of course, even in the foundation, there was that. That's where you start seeing your project coming up. And at that point, during the construction of the superstructure, it's very key because that's where you have all the, prof most of the professional or the, construct the team working together each on their own part. So that as a structural engineer at this point, I would be very key to start looking at the materials being brought to site, the quality of the materials, the quality of the sand, the quality of the ballast and the, the cement, of course, is usually standard from the factories. And uh, the stones themselves, because they are different qualities. And we have standards, expected standards and strengths of uh, these materials. And there's a way that the structural engineer would be able to tell, for example, whether the materials you bring out the correct uh, quality or not. For example, a very simple uh, rule of thumb is if I go to site and find the sand that has been brought, if I put my hands in, I'm left with a lot of dust. You know, it's very COT. Those are very serious signs that uh, most likely it will not give you the quality of the product you are looking for. Part of the quality control means you take samples, uh, you take to the lab. We have material testing laboratories where be able to test the quality of the concrete. Even for the building stones, we also have the expected uh, strength for load bearing. For example, even the sizes are different. If it's an external wall, you want to check whether the stone is the right, uh, the right size, uh, they are strong enough. If it's for partitioning, uh, it's the same. So there's a lot of uh, quality control, as well as checking that what is in the drawings is actually interpreted on the ground. Say, for instance, with the architect, we'll be checking the, the plumbness also, um, if, of, of the walling as well, the alignment also, 
of, of um, how far is it from the foundation, in case there's some features that, that we had, <clears throat> is something that we'd be checking as well at that, at that point. We'd also have the electrical uh, conduits, but this usually comes later once the walling is done. So you'd have, of course, where your switches, your sockets are, things like that. They do come in, they chase the walls, they put that, that in as well. Also, again, later the piping for your kitchen, for your bathrooms, that comes in later. Very important, um, during construction, there's a very important element that we need to keep a very keen eye on. So you find part of what we inspect is, is the formwork firm because you will need to hold your wet concrete in that position for a minimum of 21 days, for example, so that it forms, it hardens to the strength that it was designed for. So if the formwork is shoddy and not properly done, the supports are not the same level, they are bending, they were struck off too early, actually the strap can come down. The formwork should also be able to support the wet concrete, and you know wet concrete because of the water is quite heavy. It could be actually double the, the, the weight that was originally designed for. So the formwork is a very important part of the construction process for suspended slabs and, and beam. Then when you pour your concrete, it has to be properly vibrated so that it's able to cover all the reinforcement. Otherwise, when it dries without proper compaction, then it will be left with what is called honeycombing. And if you are not careful, the contractors sometimes may just come quickly, plaster cover, so that when you later around come and look, you'll not be able to see. Uh, you find if you have steel, for example, you, if you observe on a site, if you bring fresh, fresh steel bars, reinforcement, most likely after a week they are covered with rust, right? Because steel rust is the presence of water and oxygen. Uh, the rust may not be bad as long as it has not eaten too much into the cross section. So it needs to be used very fast and covered in concrete so that it undergoes what is called passivation. It becomes passive, passivation. So if you have left holes and honeycombs, it was not properly uh, vibrated, the corrosion will continue and you may find your steel actually uh, deteriorating. Hence, you even start seeing some brownish uh, stains on your concrete. The roof follows the, the, the architectural. So if the architectural plan shows a, a flat roof, then that's another slab. Uh, so it will be designed like any other slab, but uh, of course the loading it may not be the typical because it may not even be accessible. But you also need to know what's the purpose of that roof. Shall, shall we have water tanks sitting on it? And therefore that's another uh, loading, concentrated wire. So the design then will be guided by what uh, the architectural requirement is. You can also have a pitched uh, roof where you have uh, trusses. And the trusses could be either timber or steel. These days we have good technology with a very light steel, which can be used depending again on uh, the covering, because the covering is what the weight is. So the design of the roof then, the structural design of the roof will depend on what covering is that is on top. Is it the IT profiles or the Mabati types? Is it concrete tiled roofs or clay tiled roofs? They all have different weights. And this weight has to be carried by the trusses. And in the roof, uh, structural design of the roof, again, we look at how high is the building. So for example, if I'm doing a, maybe a two-story building within a, a built-up area, what that, that tells me is that wind is not a critical loading. 
if I'm building, maybe my, my structure is in the, it could be five, six stories in the middle of open country. Most likely the criteria of failure will be wind. You have seen many roofs in the countries and being blown off. It's because the criteria was not the loading, the gravity, the downward loading. The sheeting was not properly anchored and therefore the wind force just pulled it off. So you combine what is the architectural feature, then on the design, where is this structure and how high is it? How is the countryside? Because we have data of the wind speeds. We have the maps of the wind speeds everywhere. So I could design exactly the same building in Nairobi and then change for the roof in Mandera or somewhere else or where the wind is much higher. Overall, like engineer pointed out, everything starts from the architect's drawings. As the architect, we'll always be looking at the aesthetic of the building. Say for instance, if we've gone to site, we've given the drawings and maybe something happened on site. So I wanted a steel column, for instance, and for some reason, either misinterpretation or maybe an updated drawing had not gone to site. You always can catch it before it happens. Most of the time you can catch it before it happens. And you can point out and say, oh, uh, actually this is supposed to be a steel column. Or like Eugenia is saying now, if you get to the roof level, typically there are those roof eaves, which is how how far the roof projects from the wall. You know, the typical one is either maybe depending on the profile, is maybe 300 or 600, but maybe I want something larger. So maybe in the drawing I have designed maybe 1.2. Engineer has also designed 1.2. So when you go to site, you literally check. So there's also the quality control in that way where you can ensure that what you presented to the client as a 3D, as close as possible, is what you're going to, to achieve once you get onto site. Mm-hmm.